Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Legal Innovation Legal Generative AI Summit 2023. My name is Courtney Blackman, and I'm the head of partnerships at Lander and Rogers, where I run the firm's Law Tech Hub, and I've just co-led Australia's first AI clinical placement program with top research university Monash. And I'll be your host for the panel discussion with an incredible group of what the CLA has called academic and pracademic. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge on behalf of the center, uh, the College of Law, the panel, and myself, the traditional custodians of the lands and all the places in which we meet for the summit today. We pay our respects to elders past and present, and we acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining the session. We also acknowledge and welcome all First Nation people from every country that are joining us for the session. Big welcome. Um, to make sure you're in the right space, this session is focusing on legal education reinvented. No pens, no paper, no professors. Um, we'll just be discussing it with Aaron Baer, Stephen Colbram, Emery David and Tanya Lemon. So let's say hello to our incredible panelists. Erin, welcome to the panel. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining today. My name is Erin Bear. I am in Canada. Uh, I am a lawyer. I run a law firm. I run a legal training company. I'm a thought leader on LinkedIn with a mixture of complaining and actually solving problems. Uh, basically wearing a lot of hats. So the law firm I run, we, we're on a law firm that's based on all the things that people say law firms should do, how we should treat our employees, how we should work with clients, all those kind of things, really trying to embrace all those kind of things that so often are more in theory than in practice. Um, I run a training company called Feral Academy that does all the stuff I wish I had and what law students and lawyers tell us they wish they had. So we train uh, a lot of the biggest firms in Canada, as well as a number of the mid-sized firms and also some firms on uh, legal tech in the U.S. right now and more expansion to the U.S. Um, next year. I've got my own client base that I built from scratch and did it the modern way, you know, nothing handed down to me, no fancy family clients, things like that. A uh, corporate lawyer who does a lot of M&A work and basically wearing a lot of different hats, but they all actually connect. And that wasn't obvious when I started out, but I eventually figured out how all these things connect together. And I'm most passionate about how we train lawyers and in particular corporate lawyers, since that's the niche I practice in and that's the niche I serve. And that training is both substantive, uh, you know, corporate law, uh, soft and power skills, business development, all those things, and also legal tech. So all of it blends together nicely in our training. And I'm so excited to be here today and tonight uh, on my end this morning for a lot of you uh, to chat about uh, AI today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. And great to have another North American accent on, on this panel. Um, so Stephen Colburn, over to you. If you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Stephen Colburn. I'm the head of the College of Law Criminology and Justice and a Dean of Law at Central Queensland University in Queensland, Australia. Um, our particular college is very different from other accredited law schools in that we operate entirely online and have done so since our inception in 2012. So we have a completely distributed online workforce. We have no campus. Everything is done virtually. Um, so our team is uh, very attuned to using technology and legal education. And that ranges from video conferencing, Microsoft Teams, simulations, animations, and more recently, geospatial mapping technologies, which we've been using as well. So um, over the years, my career has focused on online legal education and higher degree research. Um, I've done many consultancy projects around the world with superior courts, um, including courts in, um, in Canada. Uh, looking at their computer systems and how they operate their judiciaries and their uh, scheduling systems. Also do higher education quality assurance and have developed quite a few software products over the years, things like specialist dictionaries for Microsoft Word, enterprise level marking systems, space repetition systems to enhance student memory. Some of those uh, products of uh, US patents that have been commercialized over the years. Uh, like other professors, we publish a lot, so 14 books, 80 articles, many grants, um, mainly in the areas of civil procedure, some in information technology, law, a lot in the, in the space of online legal education, and more importantly, visual approaches to teaching the law. Um, most recent project is putting together a literature review on small law firm automation for a book which I'm currently writing. And beyond all of that, I like print, uh, plant breeding, home renovation, vitreous, vitreous enameling. So thanks, Courtney. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen. Welcome. Um, and Anne-Marie, over to you. Thanks so much, Courtney. Hello, everyone. Also from Queensland, as Stephen is. 
I'm with the College of Law. I'm an executive director uh, working in the space of practical legal training. For those of you not in Australia, that's our pre-licensing training for aspiring lawyers as they seek admission into the profession here. Um, Australia, um, College of Law in Australia is the largest provider of practical legal training, and we are in or servicing every jurisdiction around the country. Um, besides a very busy workload, having been in the profession uh, 40 years plus these days, uh, my real passions outside practical legal training but aligned with that are diversity and inclusion. Very, very keen to see our profession uh, get better on that note. Uh, and also in terms of the evolving professional identity of our lawyers. And I've got a special interest to see how that is evolving now with the impact of Gen AI. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the other speakers in that regard as well. Thanks, Courtney. Fantastic. Thanks, Amory. And last but not least, Tanya, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Hello, everybody. I'm Tanya Lehman, and I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Ghana Yatta in South Australia, the lands of the Ghana people, and I pay my respects to them. So I am the Dean of Law at Flinders University. I'm also the Vice Chair of Legal Education uh, for the Council of Australian Law Deans. And in that capacity, I'm facilitating with one of the called co-chairs, uh, Professor Nick James, um, a key project thinking about what the future of legal education in Australia should be looking like as we uh, plan towards 2030. I've got a particular interest in how we can train legal professionals for the next generation and how we can ensure that not only they thrive, but they can help our communities thrive. So what does it mean for us as communities to uh, equip people with the, with the skills, with the knowledge and the competencies that we need to ensure that our communities can access legal information and advice when they need it, how they need it and be empowered? I've also um, got a particular interest in the intersection between law and emerging technologies uh, with some strange uh, bedfellows there, uh, automated vehicles, sex robots and wearable technology. And believe me, there are some links, but we can go into those at another time. Um, I also come from a practice background, so I've got experience as a legal practitioner and continue to be very heavily involved in our Flinders Legal Centre and clinical legal education. So a number of different threads there, but all looking at how we can equip future legal professionals to not only survive, but thrive and really make a difference in our world. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tanya. So as we get started today, we're going to look at how generative AI is changing legal education. And on a side note for everyone, um, everyone on this panel is embracing generative AI with optimism. Uh, so first, over to you, Erin, as both a legal practitioner and an educator, what are you seeing in Canada? How is generative AI impacting teachers? How are you preparing yourself for the sh shift? And what about students and junior lawyers? Um, are you seeing a skills gap? Yeah, I think it's it's a fascinating time because it's so obvious Gen AI is changing things and we have this enormous gap from the status quo, at least in Canada, between how prepared people are in the first place to practice law and their technology usage. I think with younger lawyers, for example, Gen Z, whatever you know demographic you want to call them, people often think they're pretty tech savvy. And the irony of Gen Z, I know I'm stereotyping a bit here, a lot of them are not very tech savvy, at least when it comes to computer basics. They are incredibly tech savvy with their phones and other areas, but it's actually been surprising on, on levels of, of lack of tech savviness in other ways. Uh, they are definitely embracing Gen AI for good, but I can already start seeing some of this reliance on Gen AI, Gen AI for not so good. And what I really mean by that is, again, I'm very pro AI you know, used properly, but if you don't understand the why behind what you're gonna do in the first place, it's not gonna be that helpful. It's gonna produce a lot of garbage um, that isn't that great. And what I've noticed in Canada from the training I do with law students, with, with law firms, with the lawyers I train at our firm, Law schools, at least in Canada, don't do a great job of teaching the why in the first place. And a lot of lawyers don't have the time and energy to teach that why. And so that's why our training is so important, the what and the why. And if you're, if you're going to have a lot of the lower level work replaced by Gen AI, for example, well, that means you need to be even better at trying to figure out, is this output, which looks very credible and seems good, is it, is it good? It's hard to know if you don't know what you're doing. So I think this need to upskill people is actually gonna be even greater. And I'll give you a quick example. I had a client recently, small business, needed help with a contract, sent it over to me to review. And I am pretty sure it was chat GPT generated. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> uh, and the order didn't make sense. It was definitely not drafted by a lawyer. Um, and so, you know, I fixed it up, um, but it got me thinking, okay, what is my actual process for drafting this contract? Where are all the places I need to look? 
And what would I need to do to train Gen AI? Or what would someone need to do to train it on this? And ChatGPT, for example, is a long way from where it needs to be for good contract drafting, but I can see clearly in my head what this would look like, how I would train it in theory, or the different things that we need to know. And that excites me in a lot of ways. But I think to be able to think about that or understand it, you really have to understand all these connections. How, what are all the different things that you need to know and almost reverse engineer? And I know Gen AI, of course, doesn't work through reverse engineering, but I think, you know, love technology, love people using it, but I think we have these enormous skills gaps already that are preventing people from being effective legal practitioners. And if that means that a lot of the lower level stuff will be done without you having to think as much, it's gonna be even more important for those younger lawyers, those newer lawyers to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and obviously how to do it in a modern way. And that means embracing Gen AI, but it also means using their brains, knowing how to leverage it and really trying to understand what is the ultimate objective? What are we trying to do? And is this output what it's supposed to be. So I think training for lawyers, practical training becomes even more important uh, because if it's replacing the lower level tasks, guess what you've got to do as the human, the higher level tasks, and those ones really require knowledge and connecting the dots. And, and that stuff is so, so, so important. Um, so uh, we're thinking a lot about Gen AI. We're using it obviously at our firm and I'll talk more about that later. But I think there's an existing skills gap. It's only going to get bigger. And it's going to be really easy for people to try to fill that gap by using Gen AI, but they've got to be careful. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't know what you're doing, Gen AI or not, you're going to have output that is not what clients need. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and coming back to Australia, Anne-Marie, if I could jump over to you and the work you're doing at the College of Law, is content being rethought? Um, and what about the delivery? What principles should guide the development and integration and generative AI and technology into legal curricula to ensure the needs of our future, that our future lawyers are met? Oh, thanks, Courtney. Um, if I might, I might just set the scene. I've explained that I work in practical legal training, which is pre-license um, or pre-admission training, we call it. Um, in Australia, the aspiring lawyers need to be able to demonstrate a set of nationally accredited competency standards touching on legal knowledge, skills, and values. Now, like all areas of education, we are highly regulated in terms of not just content, but how we deliver legal education and practical training. And in that regard, I think we need to take the bodies that regulate legal education on this journey with us. And I know uh, Tanya might have something to say about that from her perspective, uh, working with the law deans around the country. Um, so in terms of Gen AI, we're anticipating, obviously, that students are already or will soon become very familiar with the use of Gen AI as end users of platforms such as ChatGPT, Bard, Copilot, and all the others. Um, we already at the college are seeing the use of Gen AI in student submissions with and without the requirement of citing all their sources, and I'll go into the ethics of that later. <laughs> um, but yes, Courtney, we absolutely are preparing and are uh, playing with redesigning both the learning experience of how we assess as to those competency standards. Um, we will be encouraging both teachers and students to engage with Gen AI, Gen AI as much as they possibly can. Um, and for both, both audiences, teachers and students alike, we need to focus on the critical thinking skills. And I think, Aaron, you spoke to that, understanding the why and the what, um, and understanding that problem solving is um, deeper than anyone at law school actually thinks it is, I think. Um, we want them to um, understand the ethical use of these tools, and that's a very, very big minefield that we're all walking very carefully through at the moment. And we want to open eyes and minds to the myriad of potential risks for lawyers and their clients and how to engage with this technology safely. So it's a big ask. Um, I also want to talk about the very human skills we use in legal practice. So in practical legal training, we teach interviewing, negotiation, and advocacy amongst others. And of course, uh, most recently, these have changed. We have the COVID pandemic um, to fake or fast tracking the evolution of how we uh, are advocates in court now. We might be doing that via Zoom. We might be interviewing clients as we are today online. Um, I suspect Gen AI will see us leap even further in how we develop and execute on those skills going forward. And I'm excited that, at that prospect, but I'm also uh, very reserved in my opinion of um, uh, how we will see the evolution of human skills. I think we haven't given enough thought to that yet, and it's really, really important. So uh, in, in terms of human skills there, I'm talking about attributes like a growth mindset, agility, and even greater resilience needed by anyone entering, not only legal practice, but any profession at the moment. 
Thanks, Courtney. Yeah, thanks, Anne Marie. And, and that's really those are really important. Um, those communication skills and growth growth mindset that was all discussed um, and, and kind of touched on in that last panel at eleven a.m. as well. So really important. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, now, Tanya, coming over to you, um, looking through a lens of innovation. Uh, what opportunities does the integration of AI in legal education present for students and what subjects or skills should legal education prioritize to prepare students and really the entire legal industry? And what, what subjects and skills are you paying attention to? Well, we've been paying attention to the broader skills around innovation, problem solving and creative thinking and critical thinking for some time, even before um, ChatGPT was launched. And I think these conversations are not new uh, amongst people who are really thinking carefully about the future of legal ed education. And I think it's easy for us to get sidetracked in focusing the entire conversation on generative AI, because that's only one of a variety of different technological tools and other tools that are now available to legal professionals. And I think um, as we consider how these tools can be used, it really has sparked uh, a conversation and an imperative for us all to think really, really carefully about what skills and competencies do legal professionals need in the future. Now, Aaron has talked about in his um, comments earlier about the gap between the skills that students have and the skills that they need. But what is it that we need as a community legal professionals to do in future. Given that we know that probably, um, you know, half of our graduates don't go on to be admitted as legal practitioners, but they take up other roles. And so we need to factor that into our thinking. Traditionally, I think undergraduate legal uh, education, and, and this is where I, I occupy a different space to Anne-Marie, who's talking about the postgraduate um, training for admission to practice. Undergraduate legal education may lead to admission to practice, but may not. Graduate legal education space, there has been a real focus on transmitting knowledge about discrete areas of law. We know all this information about contract law or tort law or criminal law, and we need to tell you about it. But increasingly, the tools that we have at our disposal now mean that our focus must move from knowledge transition transmission to skill development and acquisition. And so I, I completely endorse the comments um, made earlier in this session and in the previous session, as you said, about 11, at 11 a.m. about growth mindset and how we can have that, that resilience to change. But I also think we really need to think carefully about how we create robust frameworks to teach innovation skills so it's not just a matter of saying to students, oh, well, you have to be creative now, or you have to be innovative, or you have to think outside the outside the square. No, we need to think about how we can create really robust, effective ways of developing curriculum that gives students a framework to be innovative, gives them a framework to be creative, gives them an explicit framework around developing those really important human skills around problem solving and critical analysis. And we need to signpost that for students all the time. So uh, as I think has already been mentioned, we are going to increasingly see tools like Copilot, um, generative AI, uh, BARD, et cetera, et cetera, just become normal. So we actually have to skill up our students in terms of how they're just using those as part of their normal working life. If we don't do that, we're not equipping them for a workforce in 2030 and beyond. Um, one of the things that we've done at uh, my university since 2020 is embed as core for all of our students in their first year, two topics um, that really start to expose our students to innovation. So all of our students have to undertake a topic called legal innovation. And then another topic called innovating social justice. And I want to pick up on some of the comments that Jordan Furlong made in his session uh, yesterday and also in the session earlier at 11 o'clock this morning about 
we really need to start thinking about how we use these tools to break out of our existing paradigms about what we understand the provision of legal services to be and what authorised legal practice might be. And, and we need to understand the obligation on lawyers to use these tools effectively to make legal information more available, more accessible to more people so that we can empower people in our community actually to do some of this really important uh, legal problem solving themselves with um, resources that are helpful, that are accurate, that are credible. And I think we should never underestimate the importance of university legal education in developing a legal literate um, legal high levels of legal literacy in our in our population and amongst our citizens. Because as we've seen in this country recently and in other places, we need all of our community to really understand how the law works. So I don't think there's a tension. I think this is a great time of opportunity to really broaden our horizons about thinking what about what legal education might and should contain and where it might and could uh, lead our graduates. Excellent. Thank you, Tanya. And now we've looked at, at kind of um, the curriculum, the tools students are receiving, but Stephen, very important question for you. In your view, how, how, how has the role of legal educators evolved with the integration of generative AI and what new skills and knowledge do ed educators need to acquire to be able to lead the transformation? All right. Um, in, in relation to that um, first question, I, look, I agree with um, um, Tanya on, on many of the points she's raised. None of none of what we're seeing is really new. All of these issues have been around quite a while, and we've seen the development of legal apps units in the past 10 years. But what has changed is the uptake of, of systems like generative AI and, the, and that, the way in which it's captured the imagination of both the profession and the public generally. Now, I think there's three broad issues in relation to that question about evolution. Uh, firstly, um, academics have been forced, I think that's probably the appropriate <laughs> term, to rethink their approaches to maintaining academic integrity because systems like ChatGTP challenge academic integrity. So it means that they've got to um, reconsider their modes of assessment, particularly written assessment, and the extent to which that can be created by these systems and perhaps not detected by the academics. And uh, the downside of that, students actually not engaging in critical thinking and not developing the skills, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, another issue on, that, uh, on the same point is um, we need to ensure that there's appropriate attribution and avoid plagiarism. And I think that goes down to citing not only that an AI system may have contributed, but what the prompt was that was used and indeed the seed ID that was used to create that um, particular outcome. The other aspect that's also been mentioned is the regulatory intervention. Um, typically, we, we see that as pushing traditional pen and paper and vigilated exams. So the regulators are, are playing catch up and, and need, I think, quite a lot of assistance in relation to that particular area. Uh, the, the second, um, I think, broad theme is that um, Academics need to ensure that students are, in fact, attaining the skills that they need to participate in this workforce of the future. Um, so that involves being able to research appropriately using the technologies. It means that they need to be able to write, whether that's assisted with technology or otherwise. Uh, we definitely need critical thinking, creativity and ethical skills. All of those things must be maintained. Um, yeah. The next thing I think is, the, the next point is really about whether we integrate, regulate or both. And I think we're going to be doing both. Regulation is going to happen whether we like it or not. Um, integration is happening. So in our particular law school, for example, we have tutorial problems which um, raise a traditional discussion amongst the students. We then encourage them to use generative AI to produce answers and then we get them to do a comparative analysis and reflection on what the differences are and where the errors and hallucinations are with these, um, with these AI systems. Another aspect is uh, case studies around prompt engineering, because these AI, particularly generative AI systems, are really only as good as the prompts you put into them. And um, we need to 
encourage students to recognize that they do hallucinate, they do produce incorrect and biased output, and that there is an ethical responsibility around understanding what those issues are. And particularly when you get into the profession, uh, there's ethical responsibilities arising there as well. The other aspect I just wanted to mention was uh, supervision of higher degree research students. Uh, we've got to make sure they don't cut corners. It's very easy, for example, for a high degree research student to pick up a, a journal article, put it into one of these systems and ask it to summarise it for them so that they can, you know, speed up their process of reading the literature. Unfortunately, you tend to get a lot of garbage um, when you take that approach at this point in time. So they need to go beyond relying on the outcome of the black box. They need to actually think about what they're reading. Um, and that's going to be a real issue. Of course, these systems will get better over time and, and we may gradually change our approach to high degree research as a consequence. But at the moment, it's really problematic. Uh, the second question you, you asked was about new skills and knowledge that educators need to acquire. Well, firstly, they need to understand the technology, um, what it can do and what its current limitations are. And that's a moving feast. So there's not just one technology, there's many technologies. They need to understand prompt engineering to ensure that the AI actually produces uh, or is more likely to produce the outcomes that they're expecting. So there's a whole new developing field around prompt engineering. Of course, they need a thorough understanding of academic integrity issues, uh, not only themselves, but also to instill that knowledge in their students that are, that are arising from these new technologies. And um, finally, I think the academics need to engage with the profession to understand how the profession are using these technologies, because after all, um, we are um, producing at least half of our graduates going into the profession. And they need to, um, we need to ensure that those graduates are actually meeting the expectations of the profession, because the profession won't employ them if they don't add value to their businesses. So I think that's um, the primary points we're to make. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, I just want to look at kind of a timeline now, because I'm sure we've got a lot of people on the call that are, are educators or, or working for universities and students and just thinking about when everything is going to be implemented and embraced. So is the change being embraced and it is happening fast enough to keep up with the pace of technological advancement? So Anne-Marie, what are your thoughts on the speed of legal education adaptation? And could I also ask you to touch on ethics and responsibility in parallel with adaptation? Sure. Um, so I think everyone on the call would agree there's no one approach or rate of knots that we're traveling at at the moment, <laughs> uh, whether at the individual or the institutional level. Um, Obviously, there are those of us who are great advocates and are pushing, 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 and there are those uh, more risk averse amongst us who are saying, let's just wait to see what happens first and we'll follow along. Um, I think Stephen touched on the fact that if it's happening in legal practice, it should be happening uh, where we train for legal practice. And certainly that's our attitude here at the College of Law. Um, and, you know, there's no doubt everyone is coming to the party, but just at a different, um, different pace. So in terms of training for legal practice, we're looking at ways um, Gen AI and other technologies can help us deliver a better, more personalised learning experience for students. I think that's one of the, the, uh, the bonuses that we're seeing um, for the use of Gen AI. And obviously, as new technology throws up opportunities to help legal practice evolve, um, we will look at how we can incorporate those opportunities in our training. I was uh, having a laugh this morning about when I started training in practical legal training 20 years ago, we were still teaching um, conveyancing settlements using or exchanging um, checks, you know, monetary checks. I'm many, meeting students now who've never set foot inside a bank. So, you know, we're evolving, society is evolving, and we will, um, we will rise to meet the need. So the willingness to change and adapt is certainly genuine, but like all things in law, tempered by regulation, again, and uh, obviously risk assessments. Uh, in terms of ethics, Courtney, as lawyers, and I'm, I'm sure everyone on the call will understand and, and in the audience, we're held to a very high standard in legal practice, so much so that our license to practice actually depends on it. One of the big issues that we deal with, and, and um, Stephen's touched on this, in the academic realm is cheating, be that plagiarism, collusion, contract cheating. Gen AI obviously presents a bigger challenge in that regard, and the way we teach and assess is changing in response to that. 
the thing is, academic cheating isn't strictly academic. It goes to one's personal sense of integrity and trustworthiness. And these are attributes that supposedly set lawyers apart from others in society. They are attributes that we trade on as a profession. So we have to go in hard to protect um, our ethical standing in that regard. Thinking even more laterally, gaming the system using Gen AI or any other tool um, used for cheating is actually a profound societal issue in my mind with implications for public safety. We all need to know that aspiring professionals are actually competent to practice, be they lawyers, doctors or engineers. Um, if, you know, if a would-be doctor has cheated their way through medical school, that has implications for public safety society-wide. In my opinion, it's no different for anyone in whom we put our trust, including lawyers. So one big, big ticket item for me in terms of ensuring that everyone that comes through the door in practical legal training on their path to admission can uh, be shown to be an ethical practitioner in the making. Thanks, Courtney. Awesome. Thanks, Amory. And just looping back to you quickly, Stephen, do you have a strategy in place at CQ University to get education aligned with the current pace of technology? And do you have any advice for other institutions as they prepare for integration? Uh, we do. So we've developed um, three broad guiding principles. Um, so firstly, around academic integrity, we've got to be confident that the work submitted by our students for their assessment is actually a genuine reflection of their own effort. Um, and we, at the same time, we need to encourage students to use systems like open AI and other generative systems because that's going to be present in their employment. Um, so we need to, and have actually developed a, a policy framework and guidelines for the appropriate use of AI tools in assessment and research. Uh, we've got awareness campaigns on foot for students so that they're aware of the ethical consequences for example, for um, plagiarism can delay their admission six months in our particular jurisdiction. Um, and um, we also have an emphasis on work-ready students, that automation is going to profoundly influence their future workplace. So we have to equip those students with the skills, the practical skills and the ethical frameworks around that so that they understand how they can use um, and navigate this uh, AI-rich environment. So the way we do that is to integrate AI into our curriculum, technical skills and ethical considerations, design case studies that simulate real scenarios, and start you know, collaboration with industry partners to make sure that that's reflected in our, in our approach. The other aspect of this is having competent staff. We've got to make sure our teachers um, who play a pivotal role in shaping the education of these students actually understand this technology. So you've got to have professional development workshops, advisory committees to monitor and review policies and guidelines because AI is changing constantly. And you're going to have training and resources in place and actually cross-disciplinary collaboration as well is important, not just looking at it from a legal aspect, but how it impacts in a cross-disciplinary sense. So they are, I think they're the main aspects that I'd emphasize in, in trying to navigate this space at the moment. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. Cheers, Stephen. And just heading back over to your side of the world, Aaron, wh where are we on the timeline over there? And what are you implementing? What milestones and developments and regulations should um, students and educators be anticipating? Yeah, I think law schools in Canada are way behind. I think Australia and especially the people on the panel are ahead. Um, I think you're probably uh, more likely to see a drop bear in the wild than a Canadian legal professor that has practiced law for more than a couple <laughs> of years which tells you everything you need to know about their ability in many cases to provide students the ability to practice law in the first place, right? Let alone use tech that's been out for five or 10 years, let alone use technology that's just out. Like you're, you've got layer upon layer upon layer. And that's not everyone to be clear, but that is the reality, the majority of the professors. In the courses we run through Foral Academy, which is my training venture, we teach substantive law and legal tech together in our courses. They are not separate. My view is if you're going to learn to close a deal, you should learn to use the technology to close that deal, for example, and not treat them as two separate things. So of course we already do that, but you better believe law schools don't do that. And the reckless part is there are so few law firms that even run their training that way. You think the law firms would be lined up for that, but again, they're often treated very separately and there's very few people that know how to teach the, the substantive part and teach the legal tech part. So you can imagine how challenging this is. There's so many different uh, things going on there. So. I'm pretty pessimistic, to be honest, about most law schools, at least in Canada, uh, changing anytime soon beyond just around the margins. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it should have already been 
And it definitely needs to be all about practical training. Whether we're talking about AI or not, that is where the shift needs to be. And obviously the people on this call or on this, uh, this panel are already doing that. Um, lecturing is pedagogically not sound. It's not sound in post-secondary education. It's not sound in primary education. Uh, that is what law school is like in a lot of cases. That was certainly my law school experience. Uh, and like Tanya said, it's not about knowledge trans uh, transmission. Knowledge is cheap these days. And with Gen AI, it's only getting cheaper. Uh, and the days of lawyers having a monopoly on knowledge are, are long over and they're about to be officially dead and gone. Um, there's a reason in our courses, we do a flipped classroom for everything. We don't lecture. We ask questions and do mock activities and then talk about it after. And I think going to some of the comments uh, in the Q&A here, you know, I think law schools need to embrace ChatGPT in class, in assignments, because people are going to use it in real life. Like we can't deny reality. The legal profession is normally slow to adopt new technology. A lot of lawyers have not been slow to adopt AI and it's only got coming more and more. So to pretend that it's not going to be there to me doesn't make sense. I will say that I've been on plenty of calls with regulators across Canada in the last few months. And there are a couple provinces in Canada that get it, uh, but so many are so behind. They're, they're 20 years behind in terms of their thinking about changes to the profession technology. They're still fighting about you know, who's allowed to practice law and trying to regulate, like, you know, we've got this access to justice crisis on one hand, and they're fighting, I would say, ridiculous fights on the other end. And the reality is AI is out of their hands. The public's using it one way or the other, and it's becoming mainstream. So on our end, what we try to do with our training and what I'm spending a lot of time doing now is reverse engineering what it takes to be a great corporate lawyer, in my case, or great lawyer of insert X category, and then saying, what do I need to train you on beyond just substantive stuff, but also on substantive stuff? And on my end, the law schools aren't moving fast enough. So my plan is to open a shadow law school where uh, essentially uh, you still have to go to law school in Canada, but my view is I can do it better. We'll be running that on the side, trying to teach substantive stuff, plus again, all the non-substantive stuff. And my ultimate goal in Canada, which is ages away given the uh, regulatory fund, would be that you don't even have to go to law school. It's sort of this focus again on, you know, as long as you're competent to practice, you should be allowed to practice. And there should be ways to get there that aren't necessarily law schools. And if law schools are able to get there, amazing. Uh, but the cost of legal education in so many countries, Canada and especially the US, for example, is so expensive and there are real barriers to access to justice, to diversity, to all those things. So I think law schools have an obligation to say, hey, how can we prepare people to come out to practice law, to reduce their anxiety and the mental health issues that come with not being prepared to practice? At the end of the day, you know, there's an obligation to students to get good value for their money. And I know that everyone on this call is, is obviously a big fan of that. But unfortunately, from what I'm seeing, a lot of regulators and a lot of law schools are not necessarily looking out for those objectives. And I hope things change soon, but uh, in Canada, we are definitely moving slower than I would like. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's really good to get that perspective um, from the other side of the world and get that global global input. Um, and really like your idea of a shadow law school. That sounds fun. Um, now we have sprinkled in regulation kind of throughout, um, but Tanya, I wonder if you could um, give some input on regulation. Can you weigh in on how regulatory, the regulatory environment in Australia um, and how institutions and governing bodies can work together to pave a way for the smooth transition to um, generative AI being integrated into the le specifically the legal education system. So I want to come at this question um, from a slightly different perspective and say, when we think about how we as institutions respond, how we hire staff, how we uh, certify that our students have met graduate qualities to, to allow them to be, um, you know, have a degree from our program, we are meeting regulatory imperatives. Before someone can be admitted, they are meeting, meeting regulatory imperatives. And the, the conversation that Amory just had before about ethical obligations on, practice, on, on practitioners, we have to think about what are the ethical imperatives that are set out in codes of conduct, et cetera, et cetera. And sadly, we don't have those imperatives that are driving our behaviour that require people to meet standards of ethical competence around safe and effective use of technology. Um, some jurisdictions do have some mention of that in their, in their ethical rules. We don't. We don't generally have in our hiring policies at universities a requirement that uh, law academics have high levels of um, technological competency. 
But it's not just technological competency because it, we need to think about this as one of a number of human skills. So a key human skill is using the tools that we have available as effectively as we can to achieve the best outcomes. And so not only should we be thinking about how we have regulatory requirements for technological competency, but we should also be thinking about how we have regulatory requirements for uh, empathy, for problem solving, for uh, critical analysis, for cultural competency, for understanding culturally and, and uh, linguistically diverse populations. Um, and the legal profession has not been very good at putting those regulatory requirements in place. It's been very much, can you tick off that you know these areas of the law and that you can demonstrate these very, what we might call traditional legal skills. And so I think uh, there is a real opportunity to think far more broadly here about what regulatory requirements we require. Um, someone who wants to be admitted to legal practice to be able to demonstrate. And then to go back to Stephen's point, we then need to think, how can we, in a reliable and valid way, assess whether or not they can demonstrate those competencies? So what, what sort of assessment validly can check that someone has got those skills? And then to pick up on something that Aaron said earlier, um, are we just talking about this narrow bounded role of authorised legal practice? Or should we as law schools be graduating students that have a wide range of skills, some of which they then may want to go on uh, to be admitted to authorised legal practice? Or do we need to pull that definition of authorised legal practice apart? So thinking about my sector generally, the tertiary ed education sector here in Australia, and it might be different in other jurisdictions, we are a very, very heavily regulated sector. There's layers and layers of legislation. The legal profession is very heavily regulated. And when you put those two together, there are layers and layers and layers of regulation. But that regulation tends to be very much about the traditional things. And so we need to start unpacking those regulatory drivers because they are driving the way we frame our curriculum, that we hire our teaching staff, that we assess our students. How can we start to pull apart that regulatory framework and think we need to, to put it back together again in a way that is fit for purpose as the students who start next year may not be graduating till 2030. And what is the world going to look like in 2030 uh, if the pace of change continues uh, as it is now, which it won't, it's going to get faster and faster. So this is an urgent problem. Um, I, I can see some comments there in, in, the, in the questions in the chat about experiential learning. That's something that we really major on at Flinders. So all of our students work um, in teams with a not-for-profit or industry client to build legal applications. All of our students do placement at our Flinders Legal Centre, getting first-hand exposure of the barriers to access to justice. We embed um, exposure to thinking about new technologies in all of our assessments, and we're really actively thinking about how we can change our whole assessment structure to bring um, experiential learning everywhere but again and again, we come up against what we might regard as regulatory barriers. So what does our institution require of us in terms of uh, a, a form of assessment of students? What do external admitting authorities require of us? Uh, and so this has to be a conversation with many perspectives. We need to, to bring all of the relevant stakeholders to the table. And I'm I'm really glad that I'm part of a project that is, is starting to do that here in Australia. But we need to bring, bring all the stakeholders to the table and say, we really need to think about what will make legal education, and I'm talking the whole life cycle of legal education now, um, what we might call general civics or, or legal literacy in senior schools, what we might traditionally call undergraduate legal education and then what we might call postgraduate legal education pre-admission, what we might call continuing professional education for lawyers who are admitted. 
And um, because just because you've been admitted doesn't you need you, mean you know all this stuff now. There's an obligation to continue that. So there's a really urgent and important conversation that needs to be ha happening. Um, bringing all the regulators and all the stakeholders together to think, how are we going to respond to, to these very different imperatives? And I think this is a time of enormous opportunity for us to say, we could rethink what the legal profession looks like. We could rethink what legal services look like. We could rethink what legal education looks like. And I'm very optimistic that bringing uh, some of the, the, the incredible minds of people together that we can really uh, seize this opportunity. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tanya. Now, we are coming to the end and we're going to get to the Q&A fairly soon, but I'm just going to ask everyone um, the same question here that's going to look toward the future. Um, is there a magical piece of software out there that is going to get everybody using generative AI and across the board? Is it Microsoft's Copilot? Are there other platforms in the pipeline? Has there not been something built yet? Um, so just a kind of a quick fire across the board. I'll start with you, Stephen. What do you think? Well, I think just like the, the early humans rubbing two sticks together to create fire, anything society doesn't understand that produces amazing results with minimal effort and cost, it will be seen as magic. Um, AI is a sort of buzzword that you see in most software one way or another these days. But the reality is there's no single platform. It's a fast evolving market. The larger players are Microsoft's, the Google's, the Apple's and Adobe's with larger market shares in with established products will have a, an initially a greater impact. But um, there's many emerging competitors with niche markets. And there's a great book by Clayton uh, Christensen about the innovation dilemma, which um, I hope people are familiar with. But we're going to see um, uh, a lot of um, disrupt disruptive technologies that are going to bring different value propositions along. And typically they're cheaper, simpler, smaller, and they're going to be implemented. The real question for law schools is what sort of graduates are we going to produce? Are we going to produce low level operatives that use AI assisted technologies to, to do their jobs and ultimately face extinction and unemployment? Or do we produce graduates that are creative, capable of producing outcomes and, you know, and are able to adapt? Uh, there's, there was a book by Richard Susskind you're all probably familiar with about the various types of jobs that will be produced in the future. I think the future is coming much quicker than even he anticipated. Uh, and even bespoke roles are becoming AI aug augmented now. Uh, at the end of the day, we need adaptive, creative graduates who can analyse legal problems in holistic ways, can communicate, can build solutions, recognise and use these AI systems. Um, to essentially add value to the businesses which employ them. But outside of that realm, um, there's no place for lawyers nor the law schools to train them. Hey, Stephen. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go quicker fire. Um, Anne Marie, you've got one minute, or maybe yes. no, 30 seconds, so we can get to the QA. Is there oh, a platform yeah. that you see that's that's gonna kind of ignite the work, get everybody on Gen AI? I'm not going to say a platform. I'm going to say it's initiatives like a summit like this, which will build momentum, will build um, understanding of what Gen AI is, what it can do, where it can take us. And mm -hmm. then as practices uh, adopt it and invest in it, that will speed things up in our world of academia. So that's where I would go, Courtney. Love it. Thanks. That's brilliant. Um, and Aaron, over to you. Super quick fire. I would say the more AI is embedded in existing things, the more likely it's going to be used. So Zoom launched an AI summary feature recently. Our firm turned it on just to see what it is. Far from perfect, but hey, better than nothing. And if you miss a meeting, it's a whole lot better than having absolutely nothing. So that's going to be the key. I think so the more it's embedded in big firm stuff, big company stuff, a Thomson Reuters, a KTX, a KSX, whatever, the more you're going to see it. But with lawyers, it's always about trust of output. But I think once they see the speed and accuracy, there's no going back. How they will deal with the pricing and the incentive issue, that is a whole fun story that I'm excited to see play out because this whole business model is about uh, not about value. It's about uh, time and AI changes that entirely. Excellent. And Tanya? And I would agree with Stephen's and Anne-Marie's and Aaron's comments. And I would just add this. If you're not already familiar with the Amica platform, A-M-I-C-A -A platform, go online and have a look at it because that's an example of how these new tools can really change a particular area of law and provide legal services to 
uh, people in the privacy of their own home for free 24 7 and it can change a whole area of law and that's what's coming and that's what we need to start gearing up for Oh, that's brilliant. That's really good advice. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, so just going to jump over. We've got some questions. Um, I think one that came in that was really good was um, a lot of universities kind of forbid folks to use generative AI and chat GPT. What, what do you guys think of that? Do you think that was the right decision or or should it be embraced and, and kind of taught? Can I start by answering? I, I don't think that given that these tools are out there and that they're in workplaces, that there is absolutely any point universities banning them. I think that's completely counterproductive. What we do need to do is equip our students in how to use those tools and to hark back to Anne-Marie's comments earlier to help them to really understand what it means to have um, a robust professional integrity and ethical framework. I'd just like to pipe in there. I mean, would we have banned students using spell checkers? Do we ban students using Grammarly? Do we ban students using any sort of technology that might help them? Do we ban them doing a search on the library's database? Um, it's it's just another tool. And, and it requires training in its use and recognising its deficiencies. Can I chime in and just say, yeah, if we course. can train this generation to use Gen AI, they will go into the workforce and train the profession. That's what we want. We want people that we know have met standards and they can then populate the world. Any thoughts, Erin? Are you good? I would say abstinence only education generally doesn't work and I don't see why it would work well here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had another one that, that came in that was quite good. And um, if I'm getting to the gist of it, um, as AI comes in, we're seeing uh, the divide on comparative knowledge being closed. So if a lawyer that was educated in the UK was not able to practice in the US, will that still exist? Or with AI coming into the picture, will, will that open up? Well, this harks back to the regulatory issues, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and and I think it's not just AI here. It's, it's a broader understanding that we live in a completely interconnected world and a globalised world. And, and how we navigate that as uh, the legal profession in different jurisdictions, I think, is becoming more pressing. And, of course, um, the capacity to really skill yourself up in a, the area of law in another jurisdiction very quickly using these tools only brings that to the forefront. But it all comes back to how we navigate these regulatory questions. Just another point on that. I mean, you, you need to be extremely careful. For example, if um, you ask a student in Australia to do a, a torts assignment, um, they'll come up. If they use uh, systems like the generative AI systems, it'll bring in its knowledge base from all around the world. So they'll start putting in, you know, references to American legislation. <laughs> uh, the, the key point here is that you've got to watch these generative systems in terms of the output they're producing, because you're not seeing their underlying logic. All you're seeing is the output, and you can't assume that that's then going to apply to your particular jurisdiction. So the, we need skills for students to recognise, and, and practitioners for that matter as well, to recognise that, you know, there are risks with the output that you're seeing, and they need to be careful. Critical analysis is absolutely critical. Agreed. <laughs> all right. Uh, oh, Aaron, did you want to? I, I was just going to say, I mean, I think uh, as was mentioned, all of this comes down to regulatory things at the end of the day, you know, that that is that is going to drive the bus both on adoption and, and who can do what. Whether or not you are able as competent as someone in another jurisdiction to provide the answer is, is probably not going to be the most important factor here. And I don't see that changing. If anything, we might see more restrictions in some jurisdictions. And I think different jurisdictions will handle things very differently, which could create a fun hodgepodge of <laughs> interesting things in terms of how lawyers practice in different areas and how that translates to what clients receive. Excellent. Thanks, Erin. And thank you for throwing in hodgepodge, which uh, has its roots in Canada and Maritime Canada. So <laughs> appreciate that. Um, this is a good one, too. Um, as educators, how can you tell when a student is using AI? Um, I can answer part of that, if that's, if that's OK. Uh, there are detection systems, although um, some universities are hesitant to use them in terms of privacy issues. Uh, but what you do find is that the, there's certain sort of language and, and there is a certain degree of similarity between the responses. And also, if you have a particular assignment that focuses on very narrow issues in, in a particular jurisdiction and you start to see generalised language that could apply everywhere, you become very suspicious 
And if you know your students, which is often difficult with larger law schools, but it, smaller ones, if you know your students and you know their written capabilities, you soon pick up that all of a sudden their approach has changed. So they're, they're some of the points I'd raise. But I think, I think this comes back to uh, assessment design and the more experiential uh, the assessment design is and the more you actually get the chance to speak with students or observe their performance, um, around skills such as negotiation, advocacy, um, interviewing, et cetera, the less opportunity there is for that. I would also say that as people get more experienced at designing prompts, uh, we should expect that students will be able to, and I've, I've tried it myself, you know, write an essay uh, to a pass standard or write it to a distinction standard or write it to a high distinction standard. And, of course, that sort of contract cheating has been going on for ages. You know, people can buy by a high distinction or a pass essay so that the sort of things that Stephen was mentioning is even harder for people to, to pick up. So I think this does bring us right back to that question of, of authentic assessment design. How credible is it? How reliable is it? And it's going to change the way we think about what we're assessing. Can I throw in um, the importance of the human in this equation? I'm hoping, as I think a lot of people on the call will be, that Gen AI and other tech will allow us to um, take away the grunt work that we do in academia. So we will be freed up to be humans with humans. So interacting with our students. And as you said, Stephen, if you know them, you know the, the caliber of their work, you know when something's awry. So I think um, certainly at the College of Law, we've been using live oral assessments via web or a face-to-face -face across a desk. And there is no better way to actually know your student, but also to know what they're capable of doing. Excellent. I would say, as, as, oh, sorry, I was going to say, as much as we're in the training business right now on my end, I think we're going to become in the assessment business because because the future is really custom training, probably using AI for each person that meets them at the level they're at. And, and as everyone said, that means a mix of assessments from written, untimed, oral, you, know, you, you name it. At the end of the day, you know, people are going to use AI for some things like they're going to use it in real life. But if you're relying on solely on one method that is very easy to cheat, then you should expect people to cheat. And, and that's unfortunate, but that is the reality. And I think as everyone said, it's just about designing the right assessments and also saying, what skills am I really trying to teach? And how do I want to teach those skills? And then you design it based on that. Thank you. Um, we probably have time for one, maybe two more. Um, is there a decision for legal graduates to make between careers in law or in legal tech or operations? And when should they make these decisions, particularly when there are onerous requirements in relation um, to practical legal training and supervision post admission? I'm going to start with this one because this is something that we talk to our commencing students about on day one of their legal careers. And what I normally do is I, I say, this is the traditional career path. And these are the career paths that are now open to you. And many of these careers just didn't exist um, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And we can't predict what new career paths will open <laughs> in the next two years, five years, 10 years. And so I don't think it's a matter of making a decision. I think it's a matter of looking as widely as you possibly can because there's all sorts of opportunities out there that just didn't exist previously. And if I can add, just from one of the presenters who spoke yesterday, um, law is fast becoming multidisciplinary so that we can better equip our students to, um, to assist their clients and value add. So the more you bring in to your legal education via another discipline or life experience, work experience, the better you will be as a lawyer, no matter what track you take, private practice, in-house counsel, um, industry and commerce. I'd, I'd just make the point too, there are some regulatory implications here. If people are hedging their bets, generally um, in Australia at least, they um, complete their law degree, many do their PLT and then get admitted. But if there's extensive delays between uh, the knowledge element of the law degree and the practical legal training elements, and their ultimate admission, it can actually impinge on their ability to get admitted because their knowledge base will be perceived to be too old for admission. So, you know, there are regulatory implications as well if you want to hedge your bets. 
the last thing I'd say here is, you know, you just got to know what you like, what you're good at, and what's going to make you fulfilled. And I think this profession has enough unfulfilled people. So whatever you think is the right path for you that you're going to enjoy and you've got skills to offer, that's the path to go on. And I think, you know, practicing for a couple of years never hurts to bring that skill set, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with deciding to go down the legal operations or equivalent paths. And for many people who do, they are incredibly rewarding. And I think it's going to be even more so as the profession, like everyone says, embraces people from different disciplines even more. Oh, thank you all. Um, we weren't able to get to all the questions, so apologies. Um, my suggestion is you chase this wonderful panel down on LinkedIn um, and get them that way. Um, so that is a wrap, but I'd like to thank everyone who came along to this and to this incredible panel. Um, hope that everybody that's tuned in has enjoyed the session. Uh, just note that this session will be available as a video on the CLI's free resource hub and as an episode in the CLI's Legalpreneurs Sandbox podcast. Um, and if you would like to receive updates about these and the work of the CLI, please be sure to follow them on LinkedIn and on all other social media. So thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.